Okay, so yeah, should we yeah. start? Okay. Yeah? yeah. All right. Okay. Well, everybody, welcome. Welcome to Starfront International Series at the Starfront for Art and Architecture. For those who might not know what the Starfront is, we are a non-profit organization in New York for the advancement of innovative ideas in the discussion of the city, the territories, and the public life in urban architecture. All our programming tries to pro produce like a alternative platform for dialogue and collaboration across disciplines, across generations, across ideologies. And that's what we are trying to do here. Right? We are uh, trying to produce that kind of alternative platform for the discussion about specific issues that are important, hopefully, for Hong Kong. The Star for International Series has been uh, an initiative that we start from started in 2014. We have already been in Dominican Republic, we have been in Lisbon, and this is the third iteration, the first time in Asia, in which well, we have been collaborating with Design Trust. Uh, I have to actually thank Marisa and the rest of the team, uh, Mavis, Dora, and the rest of the team that have been amazing, and it's been an amazing partnership to work with in order to develop this group of events that we're going to be uh, doing all these three days. And the intention of the whole thing is to talk, to talk and to discuss about relevant issues, right? elements that are happening, that are con contested in Hong Kong today, bringing international experts, quote-unquote experts, uh, but also local um, people that might be uh, knowledgeable and, and capable to really respond to those issues, and to, well, to try to discuss those and to try to address those difficult questions. And always we try to address those difficult questions at the spot in which those things are happening, right? That's why we are in a favorite today. That's why we are crossing the border between Hong Kong and mainland China. And we are uh, we are going to be discussing today about transborder territories, right? We are going to be discussing about the border conditions, what does it mean uh, for the architectural and design uh, environment to, to be connected to that kind of condition and to respond to it. And the format of the event uh, is a reading series uh, because the Starfleet International Series always translates certain of the experimental formats that we develop at the uh, at the uh, at the gallery, and we bring them to the to the different to the cities in order to scan the, those issues that we were talking about. And the reading images series has a very simple format. It's like we have brought like some images, a collection of images that have been contributed by Merve Bedir, Penas, Lau, Map Office, and Style Luan. And they have contributed some images, all the participants have seen them, and they have chosen one image, or maybe two images, or maybe they have they are going to be uh, looking at the landscape that we would have in front of us. And the idea is that each of the participants are going to be reading that image, they're going to be looking behind what that image uh, has, and to discuss about the social, political, and, and cultural implications that those images might be able to talk about. So, without much further ado, I'm going to pass the voice to Marisa and that can also talk about the different members of the participants today. Um, and yeah, I'm basically thanking all the participants for being here. I'm very excited for this conversation to start. Thank you so much. cultural 
organizations um, play a specific role productively in this context. We have just left one of the 12 border control points of Hong Kong and we will be arriving into Shekou, which is basically Snake's Head. So I want to open this up to make us think about the question of the reality and the image production of our city um, because as you see in Hong Kong, we're just passing by the West Kowloon Cultural District, another new cultural district. We've just passed the ferry terminal of Macau, which connects to another neighboring city. Um, but in our city, we have 7.3 million inhabitants um, and a population living in a high dense environment. And we can see both the British colonial influence and the new Chinese identity that is conceptualizing the future of Hong Kong. And I'm so delighted to be able to introduce such a great group of speakers today to join us um, in this discussion and sharing. So Carlos, again, Associate Curator from Storefront. Uh, we have Etha Barano from uh, Barcelona, a critic, writer and curator. Uh, we have Ole Bauman, the founding director of Sherco Design Museum and the founder of Value Factory. Uh, we have Cole Roskam here, Associate Professor from Architecture, History and Theory. Uh, from the University of Hong Kong. Shirley Surea, uh, Associate Curator from Design and Architecture at M Plus, um, who's also been working a lot on these discussions. Paul Day and also Evelyn Ting uh, from New Office Works, who also are Design Trust uh, grantee community working on a very interesting new project. Um, and then we also have Jason Hilgerford from A Formal Academy from Shenzhen. So welcome everyone and I'm very excited. This is a milestone event um, for the image series we can kick off. So thank you very much. Thank you. So maybe we can go for it and we can start already with the first reading image that okay. is gonna be by Evelyn Ting. of the space in between is it for 
border crossing. And um, as an architectural historian, I guess of all the images, I immediately gravitated towards the architectural objects. And this one in particular, and the reason is, is that it resonates in a number of ways, I guess, with some of my research and my, my interests in living in Hong Kong and teaching at the University of Hong Kong. Um, so the first, the first question and, and issue that I thought about was, of course, the history of the border itself between Hong Kong and China, which is, like, like all borders, a geopolitical construct. The, the history of the border actually is relatively recent. Um, when the British arrived on Hong Kong Island, that was that that island, the the, the the edge of the island marked the British territory. And then in 1860, of course, it was expanded into Kowloon, and then 1898 extended up into the new territories. But even despite those sort of those extensions, there was no physical demarcation line distinguishing mainland China, then Qing territory, from Hong Kong. Well into the 20s and 30s, uh, ethnically Chinese residents of Hong Kong could freely travel up into Guangdong. So it really wasn't until 1949 and the Civil War and of course the Cold War that the border was actually officially and physically demarcated. And so here we have a, a border crossing that I find interesting, not only because it occupies the same kind of liminal position that just came up with, with respect to a ferry as being a kind of liminal space, so, so is a border a liminal space, right? And yet we're told that Hong Kong is of course part of China and this object sits somehow in between Hong Kong and China. So how can they both be one and yet two di distinctive parts? And that, that's an awkward relationship that, as we all know, is still being worked out. Um, and the, the awkwardness for me is, is, is embodied and really crystallized in this image through the aesthetics of architecture, right? Here we see a building that's been designed, at least externally, to obviously look Chinese based on the red columns and the, the gold tiled roof structure. So we have this building in the middle of, of a no man's land, a liminal space, that somehow is compelled to kind of mark itself as Chinese. And yet the question becomes, in passing from one Chinese controlled territory into another Chinese controlled territory, why is there the need to mark this object as, as somehow identified as Chinese? And so I find those questions to be really fascinating. And they also speak to the broader ways that architecture participates in some of these 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 geopolitical issues and these cultural issues um, how how architecture can be used to define boundaries and also blur boundaries and the way that architecture reacts and responds when those boundaries change and evolve over time so um, uh, that's that's my image thank you thank you we're gonna move now to Shirley please Not 
not just a city like Shenzhen or a city in, in, in China aspires to be. This is in the 80s. Instead of that, Hong Kong becomes the other side, the other, the other way right now. Back to its maybe you can say primitive form of that fishing village or whatever that is, right? Uh, whereas, uh, whereas that other side, which which used to be the village, had kind of moved on, building all the way until the edge of the river. Okay, so they're they're really kind of um, maximizing, I guess, in some in some way. So that's one bleak thing, and the bleak thing I almost uh, asked myself, like, okay, I guess in reflecting a, a kind of a condition today is that that sort of like. The balance or the balance of transactions between the two cities or even Hong Kong and China itself could easily tipped uh, at the moment because in the past, sure, you know, the overseas kind of like investment uh, comes from, I mean, Hong Kong was a major like a contributor to, to Shenzhen or even China at that point. But now I think the dependency is going to be even more the other way, reverse, uh, where Hong Kong is going to be not just dependent on China's money, but also not just waste disposal, water and all food, whatever that is, but even more knowledge. So, or systems, I don't know, it's, it's gonna come back. So it's that sort of like, okay, where is Hong Kong then? Like, you know, you're you're returning to a more regressed state in that sense. But again, it's like a very bleak reading. <laughs> the other reading is, of course, uh, I call this the recalcitrant buffer reading. So the green zone as the, you know, I am standing as strong as possible as long as I could before 2047, right? And even this little green space could be considered as a potential for a kind of different kind of development. Because I think, I think the, the story here is that, of course, the, it's, a, it's a space where it's about showing the value of Hong Kong that is not just driven by pure capitalistic kind of motivation, right? So the idea of conserving it to, to keep its natural ecology, the whatever the estuary, um, you know, like uh, uh, historical villages, whatever that is, there's a reason why they want to keep that. They want to keep or remember the part where that pristine state in which Hong Kong used to be or even what Shenzhen used to be and not having to even progress in a very material economic sense or way. So that could be another symbol uh, of what Hong Kong is trying to be, uh, really standing uh, its ground. Uh, but of course, the space itself, I mean, from an architectural point of view, is also considered to be a potential of how this could be designed as an interface in which the, the, the relationship between China and Hong Kong or Shenzhen and Hong Kong could be less oppositional as possible by 2047. And so I think there's a lot of potential in that sense, you know, what could this, what this space could be. And so that's my reading, my two readings of this.
China side, you will see like you know people like meeting their young girlfriends and so on. While on the other hand, in Hong Kong side, I actually first-hand witnessed that people would um, middle-aged lady would wait at the bus stop, and as soon as their husband arrived. And then you know people like they will start crying and so on. So there's this really extreme like happiness and sadness at the border of, of you know Wang Gang. So I think to me that's um, what what I what I can read in this image. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. What time were you on that bus? <laughs> <laughs> Many provocative images that I can help to select too. Mm -hmm. yeah. From map of no, Merva Bedira and map office. And why I didn't select these two images? Because uh, when I was reading the brief to talk about borders, and we all, I think, somehow more or less have faced this uh, migrant situation. We were doing the queue today to have the visa, but at the same time, often we don't think about the lack of borders. And these images for me talk about other realities and other liars that don't respect any physical border, which is the, the liar and the, and the reality of the capital flows. Here we can see capital exchange of merchandise or whatever. And here I, I find very provocative that we have the natural landscape and how it's been uh, uh, colonized by the real estate market, by the capital. And I think it's a very interesting situation, especially in a context like this, that of course I'm not an expert, but I think that the, these uh, realities and these flows of capital also affect the urban conditions, because there are people working, in, uh, living in one side, coming to work to the other, going all the way around, and all these flows that affect also the infrastructure of transportation in the city, affects our reality in our daily life even if we don't see this, because the, what is very interesting is that these other uh, economical powers that doesn't respect any physicality of any borders uh, has this materiality in our daily life by this kind of flows, infrastructures, transportation, the way we work, the way we live, uh, perhaps the way we eat, you know, how fruits or vegetables or food uh, is transported from one uh, side to the other. So this is something that I wanted to highlight or to address more than to state or make a statement because I, I'm just a, an observer, an outsider in this reality, but to address for the discussion, to know more and to discover how is this, uh, the borders and the lack of borders coexisting in this, uh, in this uh, daily reality. So I think this, uh, and also, I would love to know more for the perhaps for the future plans because we know that that the the treaty or the agreement of this uh, one land two systems uh, also has uh, different layers of reality, the law, legality, uh, but also uh, how it affects normal people with, uh, in their daily life, in the way they work and also people who are just trading or investing and doesn't need to visit the city or have these problems so how these realities affects one or the other so I think this is the questions I want to address and to know more because I think we, we cannot talk about that physical reality without taking into account the other because it affects our daily life in fact uh, in a very strong manner by the way so I think this is something that I, I would love to discuss uh, later on that's it Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now we can move to Jason. Yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. As far as the image I chose, uh, I chose the one here uh, from Map Office by Valerie and Laurent. Uh, because I have a, um, uh, like was mentioned in some of the text, a lot of people go back and forth. I, I technically live in both cities. Um, but in reality, I mostly live in Hong Kong. So I actually, uh, but my job is in Shenzhen. So I cross the border uh, all the time. Uh, but the other legal reality to mention, uh, because I have the benefit of being originally from the United States, uh, I have a very good visa situation. So I have no legal right to work or live in either China or Hong Kong. I am a constant tourist 
uh, when I go back and forth. And so I always uh, enjoy also this border crossing that there's a box out of all the normal things one would have is I'm here for employment or sightseeing. There's one that just says visit, which I enjoy <laughs> that I get a click every time when I cross the border because that's the most vague thing possible, which is kind of exactly what I'm doing as a perpetual tourist. Uh, but I also think about these these zones, uh, some people call them states of exception if you're into Agamben and things like that. But I think it's not even just about Hong Kong versus uh, the mainland. This kind of idea of, um, <clears throat> as, uh, as Adrian Blackwell, who's out of uh, Toronto, describes it, um, in, this, in the Pearl River Delta, uh, borders are used to facilitate exchange. And I think it's not just about the Hong Kong Shenzhen border. This has manifested itself in the area, thinking about things like special economic zones. I would even argue the way the urban village reality works in Shenzhen has got something to do with a weird border reality. And then as we all know, going forward, forward places like Tianhai and the Luk Machao Loop, um, the notion of borders here is really understood to be a gray area or imaginary lines that can be moved and manipulated to give benefits or privilege uh, in many ways. So it's not just about separation, uh, although it's about that as well, uh, but it's about many things. But about uh, the way that we connect and then forget the picture, but looking outside, uh, we had a nice moment, me and Mervo, when we were doing the uh, A-Formal Academy as part of the Biennale. One of our students, we kept talking about Delta, 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 and she was one of our brighter students and spoke, she was a mainlander, but spoke extremely good English, but she admitted she had forgotten because within the Chinese discourse, Delta is actually only used to talk about urban development. So it's the Yellow River Delta, the Yangtze Delta, and the Pearl River Delta. So she didn't even remember that Deltas are actually an ecological reality, uh, which was another kind of fascinating thing for us that blew us back. Um, and then um, there's the reality of the Pearl River Delta, at least for us, again, out the window. Uh, the leader Xi has now designated this area to be the Big Bay area, um, which at least for me, I find like wildly ironic uh, that an area that's notorious for copying, especially in terms of Shenzhen, not necessarily Hong Kong, when they choose to rebrand itself on a global scale, they rebrand itself by copying the thing they want to copy. Uh, so they call themselves just the Big Bay area. And so these, um, in many ways, when I start to think about what will bond these two regions together as they go forward, it really does become bonds or capital. It, it is the money, interests on both sides that actually tend to be the bonding agent. Um, there's obviously cultural realities and many other things, but in terms of when you see the governmental forces, it's uh, very interests that allow them to kind of start to want to create this thing like the Big Bay Area where they start to allow the exchange and the border to disappear. Then on a very personal note, coming back to the picture, find fascinating um, is at least historically uh, uh, well whatever in its recent history Hong Kong because of its British tradition you walk on the left and you drive on the left in the mainland you walk on the right and you drive on the right and so when you cross the border at times you can feel this in terms of the signage on the ground because almost all the time in Hong Kong they have little arrows but now you notice uh, the arrows have started to shift and for me, at least in the Hong Kong reality, this is like a metaphor for the entire reality of Hong Kong. It's like the, the people who are Cantonese and have been there for a while instinctively want to walk on the left, but all of us foreigners or even the, the mainlanders that come there all want to walk on the right. So there's always this like negotiation when you're walking through a hall or down the sidewalk of like, do I go left or right? And you can feel that Hong Kong is being forced to the right. Uh, so it's just a personal note, but yeah, I always feel it at the border because the say the entry signs are different in terms of do I go left or right. So yeah, that's uh, that's what this uh, image made me think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're going to have the last reading that is from Carbolio. I think this is a very nice uh, uh, let's say moment to think about spatial navigation on the sidewalk in Hong Kong as, um, let's say, exemplary to the, uh, to the greater Bay Area experience. Um, where are we now? Can, you, can we identify our location? Uh, actually, I think we are yeah, a bit ahead of our cell phone company. Yeah, we're still uh, a bit early, right? We are a bit ahead, early, of early. Early. ahead of schedule. We're ahead of schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that allows me to uh, start with some formalities. Uh, thanking you for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, 
uh, I had no um, issue whatsoever to say yes to an invitation by uh, Storefront uh, because uh, the very first time I did any international presentation back in 1994 uh, that was uh, to present a book I wrote with some friends uh, called The Invisible in Architecture uh, and we presented it uh, by invitation of uh, Kyung Park mm -hmm. and uh, Shirin Nashat uh, who were uh, together there and ran, ran storefront back then which was a wonderful uh, moment uh, and uh, so nice to, to do something with storefront again um, almost a quarter of a century later uh, and I also uh, had no problem to say yes again to um, a request by Marissa to join this because um, uh, in 2009 I think was my first serious visit to Hong Kong um, I went to her uh, do-it-yourself Biennale, which was uh, part of the Bay City Biennale, and in a way also uh, a negotiation of space um, uh, by many different contributors trying to identify spatial conditions in this area. So um, uh, thank you for, for uh, organizing this. Uh, it reminds me, uh, and we have time enough, so I, it reminds me <laughs> so of uh, uh, another event um, that I organized with the Arcus magazine. Uh, I think uh, quite a few of you are uh, familiar with the Arcus crew. Uh, we, um, we started a series of events called RSVP events uh, early, um, early this century. Uh, and one of the events was um, dedicated to the theme West versus East or West becomes East. And we uh, organized a conference in eight compartments in a train from Poland to Moscow to discuss with the locals, the local commuters, uh, you could say commuters, um, what it means that there is a kind of ongoing geopolitical shift to the east. And uh, it was a fantastic experience to just occupy these compartments with just a strategic one or two people occupying a, an eight-seater and start a conversation about why are you here right? Right. and what are you doing here. And um, it was basically like this. Uh, and it, it, it yielded fantastic materials for uh, a special issue about this topic. And actually, um, back then it was still a question like, um, is the West, um, let's say, um, giving way, or uh, um, let's say, starting to give, uh, let's say, transfer power, transfer um, uh, the, the, the geopolitical gravities to the East. But that's, of course, absolutely no question whatsoever anymore. Uh, although, right now, in all the political debate, um, in a way, the, the um, shifts happening in this region are still about that in some, in some respect, right? So it's, it's, it's east versus west, even in this tiny little uh, uh, greater urban, uh, greater uh, uh, Bay Area um, conundrum. It's, of course, that geopolitical, it's a global issue that is played out here. And we are now finding ourselves in this uh, tiny little ferry space, actually in the midst of, of these, all these energies. And um, I think uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that from the point of view of landscape. Uh, you, you have chosen the, the maritime connection to the mainland. Uh, it could also have been the, the bus or the taxi or um, a van. There are several ways to do it depending on your status, depending on your wallet, wallet uh, depending on a couple of things. Um, but I think the maritime one is, of course, uh, highly symbolical of um, really a reconfiguration, of culturally speaking, econo economically speaking. And uh, I hope uh, the people who are here for the first time are still, let's say, uh, novices in terms of grasping this conundrum. Uh, I think uh, the lessons to learn are um, uh, exciting. Actually, for myself, uh, this started already quite a few years ago. I'm, I can say I'm a local now. I'm no longer a visitor. I'm a local. Uh, I'm a mainlander. Uh, I can even say I'm more a mainlander than Jason. He is still um, hesitating where he belongs to. But I just belong to Shenzhen. And I live there and I work there. And I'm starting a new design institution called um, Design Society that opens uh, early December this year, uh, for which you are all invited. Actually, that um, the design institution uh, should deal and should address and will address these kind of uh, issues, uh, certainly, but uh, not only address them, it will also try to, to demonstrate what it brings.
brings to design. It wants to showcase that. It wants to capture certain opportunities for design for further development. And I have one minute, and uh, I wonder whether in this one minute the horizon or this, the, the skyline of Shaco will show up. We can, we can go to the seven minutes perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I just want to say Disneyland. We just passed Disneyland and Chetlap <laughs> Cop. As a counter to Shaco. Oh, we are only there. No, we just passed down yeah, there. Yeah, okay. so yeah, we just pulled away from. Because I thought uh, <laughs> to. to uh, one of you already talked about um, one country, two systems, and that we are, uh, let's say, in the in, in the in, in the middle of, of in the midst of, of those tensions. But you could also so just between the two. But in a way, you could also say that we are all part of becoming system three. So we, of course, you could say we just left system one and we moved to system two, or or the other way around. But in a way, we are all working. We are all living through the becoming of a system three. And uh, the, the reference that uh, Jason Hillsford just made about this um, new um, national policy paper about the Greater Bay Area, in a way, is, is like anticipating system three uh, and to try to identify role role play uh, and where different zones could start to become a kind of logical entity in a, in a bigger picture. And this bigger picture um, that can be not just already seen in documents, but in a way you could already see it in real life. And if you would if you would look at the skyline of Shenzhen and Shaco, I could identify already some of those hints of the future. Um, but since there's no horizon yet, uh, maybe we, 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 we soon at the ferry terminal and then we have some opportunity. But let me first uh, refer to that picture over there on the wall. You see that advertisement? It's, it's called Smart Growth. And you see actually the horizon of Shaco already from the other side. So in, uh, um, uh, in absence of the real horizon, let's just focus on that one. Uh, because um, the title, um, Smart Growth, is the slogan for a new Shaco, uh, a Shaco that uh, tries to retain or tries to recapture its symbolic role in the history of uh, China. It used to have that role 35 years ago already when uh, it, has, it was um, uh, being dedicated to industrial growth and uh, economical experimentation by uh, special permission of uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, and it became the cradle of Chinese modernization in a way by intense uh, investments in industrial growth. And uh, for many people, uh, Shaco is, can be seen as the kind of uh, birthplace of um, um, China's modernity. And in the last 10 years or so, um, in the transformation of Shaco from an industrial place to a post-industrial place, once again, they try to find clues that it could retain that kind of symbolical role to um, uh, pre-configure what the next, what system three could be. And um, they call it smart growth, but uh, you can interpret it with whatever you, you want, but it's, it's clearly an indication of recapturing its symbolical role. And uh, there are many questions that we cannot address today, but uh, I, I anticipate you this weekend to continue discussing what that could be and how um, your personal work and how um, design trust work and how even an international as a, I, I read um, storefront is Hong Kong so there are clearly identification issues so so you're identify already yourself with with this place so great um, please address those questions I think uh, it will be exciting um, but going back to the horizon in the middle of the of the picture you see a tower uh, and that's the China Merchants Tower. Yeah, I guess you see it, it's a bit uh, brownish, grayish. And China Merchants Tower uh, has now been seconded by a couple of other China Merchants Towers. But that one uh, was the first, uh, already built early 80s, to, um, to house the uh, main office of China Merchants as the state-owned company, running actually Shergo. Uh, and it still does. It's also the, the driver behind uh, Design Society. Uh, it's still uh, a kind of innovative uh, company trying to not only to uh, run business but also to take uh, certain social responsibilities and guide future developments in China, uh, for instance in the field of culture. And that's also why something like Design Society came into existence uh, to um, to experiment with the role of creative industries as part of the larger societal transformation. Uh, and that and that 
tower over there for many locals, for many Shaco or Shoko Ren or Shenzhen Ren. That's uh, that's actually the place where it all has been um, conceived. Then uh, you see uh, several uh, other residential units uh, already on that picture, and that's clearly also the sign of the transformation from a industrial age to a post-industrial age. On the, on the, I, I, you cannot see this, but I can tell you that on the more on the right side there is the industrial zone, and there are still uh, some factories, but most of them are abandoned, already uh, reoccupied, or has been demolished. To uh, make room for residential development and create a society more about um, service industries but certainly also for leisure and if you take a look here you see uh, some pictures here uh, about the new Shaco uh, the ferry terminal and even the golf links on the boat and fitness and swimming pools coming back uh, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's like uh, giving hints of a completely different lifestyle uh, and in a way it could also be seen as a narrative that that all the hard work brings you to the next stage of let's say enjoying life or of course many questions about for who is this supposed to be uh, who is uh, what, what bigger interests are at stake and clearly uh, you can certainly discuss that but in terms of the narrative that is coined here, is, is invented. I think it's important to know how, how it works. Uh, here you it's, it's a leisurely life. Right. And uh, cocktails are good. <laughs> All inclusive package, you see, but for service. So there is, uh, there is a kind of promise, a pledge about uh, a better life um, for all. So there is uh, uh, a lot to further reflect upon this. Uh, where are we now? Uh, you can now see the old, uh, the yeah. old farming system that remains from, uh, from historically, but we're still about five minutes from Shaka. Yes. <laughs> so uh, if you take a look on the right side, the, the blurred image is, uh, you know, take it for granted. Uh, you see the oyster, the oyster banks. Uh, yeah. If you take a look, so every morning, um, the old Shenzhen still enacts its its um, timeless duties so to speak, by um, the fishermen going out of the old uh, harbor and, and, and um, harvesting the, um, the, the fishery and the oyster banks. And then behind it, you see the Shenzhen um, Bridge, the Bay Bridge, which uh, is one of the more recent connections. And actually, I came over that bridge this morning, uh, landing into uh, uh, Hong Kong, and now uh, going back. Playing, playing this uh, storyline of um, uh, encounter, matching, um, getting together uh, almost physically and literally. But the bridge itself also provides a scenery that is about connection, of course. So the, the, the majestic uh, structure uh, crossing the bay is for many people also already, like say, a clear anticipation of how these worlds Two different worlds or two systems are uh, in a way connecting ever closer. Uh, what can we see more? Well, maybe we can also like yeah. start the conversation and yeah. we can also come, in back, come back to the, to the landscape. Uh, so that, I, 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 to finish, we are slowing down because we are must be quite close to the ferry terminal. You will see the ferry terminal is a brand new building, just really new, opened only a few months ago. It's designed by a French designer, uh, but it's uh, clearly also uh, image, uh, image production, it's uh, image produced to anticipate this new Shaco, this new China, uh, in a way that uh, is very important to appreciate, to appreciate because it's, it's something, it's clearly a big effort. Uh, and I wish that we could have a better view, because then besides the ferry terminal, to the right there is the Design Society building, uh, and if you have time in this weekend to come back, I know you will, come, you will go uh, immediately after this, this trip, but if you have time to come back, please visit the, the building of Design Society, designed by the Japanese architect, Fumi Tomaki, and again, representing or anticipating that, that future uh, China that actually uh, not only the Chinese are working on, but also you are working on, uh, just by organizing this and trying to grasp all the implications. 
So are we already arriving to the station? So maybe yeah. what we can do is to we can have like one or a couple of comments and then we will have to continue the conversation because we just started this, right? Once we start like the whole thing back to the uh, back to the Okay, so well thank you for like this first step of the event. Thank you everybody for the readings and let's uh, let's stop now, let's have some lunch and then we can come back. All right?